Once again, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining this session uh, with Kate Carruthers. Um, she's the Chief Data and Insights Officer at uh, UNSW in Sydney, Australia. Uh, she's the Chief and uh, Data and Insights Officer uh, and is also an adjunct senior lecturer in the School of Computer Science and Engineering. She's currently undertaking postgraduate studies in terrorism and cybersecurity, which is quite an interesting combination. Um, she's currently working at the intersection of data analytics, AI, machine learning, privacy, data protection, cyber and information security. Uh, me personally, I'm, I'm quite interested to hear what you have to present this morning, Kate, as it's a, it's a topic I think everyone is uh, very concerned about when it comes to um, uh, all things cyber security related around data and analytics. So uh, with that, Kate, I'll hand over to you. Uh, I'll jump in about five minutes towards the end uh, and uh, I'll help field any questions should they, they come through in the chat box. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kate. Thanks very much. Uh, thank, thanks very much for coming today. I'm really pleased to be able to talk about this because I'm really proud of my um, high-performing analytics team. Uh, and I want to share a bit about how uh, we managed to do to build a high-performing analytics team. And um, you might say, how do you know you've got a high-performing analytics team? And the answer is we've actually won uh, quite a number of awards uh, for the stuff that we've done. And the thing that I keep saying is, I just have the ideas. My team is the one that are the people that bring it all to life. And the only way we can do what we do is be by being a high performing team. So I'm going to uh, cover some of the stuff that I think is really important about building a high performance team. So I'm not going to talk a lot about data. I'm going to talk a lot more about team and culture. So I'm going to cover off uh, eight, eight items that I think are essential for building a high performing team. And then for the ninth thing, I'm going to do a case study about how we transition from our legacy platform to our modern data platform. So that's what we're going to do today. So just to put some context around it, if you want to build a high performing team, you actually need to plan it and you need to give it some thought. So it really is a matter of getting the ducks lined up. And an important thing to remember, though, is this. This is a really well-known, world-famous saying from Peter Drucker that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And some say it eats it for lunch, too. Uh, culture is really, really strong, and it's really powerful. And it's really hard to change. There was one organization that I worked for back in last century. And I left uh, at the 2000 Olympics, the Sydney Olympics. I went to another company. And I stayed in touch with my colleagues there. And that company poured millions of dollars each year into cultural change programs. And I came back a decade later and I walked in the door and nothing had changed. It was still exactly the same culture as I'd left a decade before. Culture is really resilient. And to change culture, you need to think about it really carefully. And this is, this is the equation that I always think about is that culture is what people do. It's what they do habitually. It's what they do without thinking about it. It's how we do stuff around here, plus practice. So it's the things that they do. So it's people plus the things they do. And it's also what the organization and the leadership measure. So those are the things, those are the essential components for culture from my perspective. And it's worth keeping that in mind when you're trying to build a high performance team because you're trying to shift culture from A to B. Now I'm going to run through the essentials for a high performing culture. And this first one is probably the most important thing at all. There's a lot of research now that that shows that to have a really good team, you need to have a feeling of psychological safety. So you need to be able to feel that it's okay to try new things. You need to be able to feel that it's okay to make a mistake and that you, your team and your leaders have your back. And that feeling of psychological safety, I feel is really important in underpinning a high performing team. And the other thing is that the people really do need to understand that to build a really good team and to deliver really high quality products, you actually need to harness their creativity and passion. And it, it is really welcome as part of the process. And a lot of the time, uh, especially in technology and data teams, we just don't think to tell people that we really want them to be 
providing input. So that's another thing that's really important. And I feel like all of these things are brought together by the leadership. So um, the leader is the person who brings all of these threads together and starts to uh, tell the story to their team so that they can work out if they want to buy in or not. And this leads to strategy. And I learnt in management school that strategy is all about steering the ship and, ta and tactics are about rowing the ship, which is as good an explanation as you, you need. But typically you'll see when you're thinking about your data strategy and your analytic strategy, you typically see some sort of diagram like this. And you need to do all of the things on here. So I'm not saying you don't need to have these in place, but you need to have a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today around it. Otherwise it won't take, it won't, won't, you'll plant it, but it won't grow. So you need, a, you need a data strategy that is aligned to your business strategy. You need to have your data governance in place. You need to have all the roles and policies and procedures set up. And I'm always rabbiting on about data governance. People that know me get sick of it. Um, and, and you need to understand your platforms and how you're going to do integration and how you're going to manage lineage and all of those things. They're all the things that we have to do. That's a given. What's really essential, though, is a narrative that we need to start to tell a compelling story about why we're doing the strategy. Why do we need to change? Why do we need to do a new thing? And this is, this is probably one of the more important things that technologists and data people often don't consider that they don't think about their audience's information needs. And often they don't even think about their audiences. And you, I know, we kind of, we kind of joke about vision. You know, we we've all we've all heard about the Enron vision and mission, which sounded really high and noble, but you know they came to a, a sad end. But you need to have a vision, which I always articulate as as goals and aspirations. What are we trying to aspire to? Uh, and we that's an important thing for framing what you're trying to achieve. And so you, you need to have a vision that can be made real to people and that they need to understand what mindset and what behaviour they need to bring to bear, what changes they need to make to help deliver the vision. And then there's the, the mission. And this is the fundamental question of what do we do? And going back to that first thing that I said about culture being people plus practice, what do we do is really important because what we do and what we value is what shifts people's culture. It shifts what do we do around here. It shifts what is normative behaviour. And probably these four things are the most important things to think about when, you, when you're starting out to a, build a high-performance team and launch your data strategy. So... First of all, think about what you need to stop doing because it's probably more important to work out what you need to stop doing and what you're going to do less of than the things that you will start doing because the things that you, st that you want to stop doing and that you have less of are the things that you will find that certain people will cling to and it will be very difficult to shift them away from that. And you need to look at what you need to do more of and what things you will, what new things you will start to do. And you need, to, this is why the psychological safety is really important because you're going to be asking people to do new things. And when you ask people to do novel things, they will not do it happily unless they feel psychologically safe. If they don't feel that it's okay to not be successful, they will not willingly start doing new things. So all of this you can see kind of all ties together. I want to talk about talent management because it's a real issue now. Um, some of our banks here in Australia have up to a 1,000 vacant positions and the talent for data and analytics people is, is really hot uh, at the moment. So I want to talk about getting them. Uh, it, it is hard to find them. Um, so one of the things that I've always done is I actually hire for capability and attitude. Now, there's a plethora of articles out there saying you should hire for skills, just hire for skills. That'll... 
I don't bother because I hire smart people and I get people who can learn new things. So I hire for capability and attitude and I look for adjacent skills. And one uh, brief anecdote, uh, we hired uh, a young woman and one of the tests that we give our people, we do interviews plus skills tests, and we did a, um, a skills test with her with her SQL coding and she said, I don't know SQL. And we said, just tell us how you would approach solving this problem for us, even if you can't code it. And she had a really good approach to that and we thought she would be really good. She came in in a junior role and she got promoted, promoted, promoted. This is about four years ago. And she's she was one of our stars. She's just got a job in a gaming company, which we're really happy for her because um, she's a mad keen gainer, gamer. Um, but so it was somebody who didn't have the skills but had the, the right mindset and adjacent skills that could learn stuff. And the other thing is not to look for unicorns. So don't have a laundry list as long as your arm and then seek every single skill on that list uh, because you'll be doomed to be disappointed in this current market. I think it's a, it's a fun place to look for people. Um, and and in, spec, in, in respect of keeping your staff, keeping your staff, um, I just recommend to treat them like adult people who, who know what they're doing. Um, I've very, very, very rarely let down. And uh, an important part of what our approach is, is we're very inclusive and very collegial. Uh, and we engage our teams in more than just transactional work. So we really bring people into the decision-making process about the work that they're doing. Uh, if, if you wanted a transactional job, you wouldn't come and work with us, uh, I don't think. And the other, the last bit is, is letting them go. And it's always sad to lose good people. Uh, but the looking on the bright side, they are a great source for new talent. So if they find people, they can send them your way. And the other thing about some people that just don't work out, you need to get rid of them really quickly because they can destroy your entire strategy. The other thing that's really fundamental, and we don't often consciously think about relationships when we work when we work in technology and data and analytics, uh, but work is really about relationships. And I've really seen it uh, really bring come to life in COVID, where we've been working off the bank of social capital that we built up in the years before COVID to keep our relationships alive when we didn't see people in real life. And I'm always saying to my team that I'm expecting them to be out and about. I don't expect them to always be at their desk, but I expect them to be out building relationships with their business colleagues, that, that the people that they do work for. Uh, so that's another important thing that is often not well thought of in, in IT and analytics roles. And again, I will reiterate it, I do not hire for skills, I hire smart people who can learn new things. Um, it, it's, I still don't understand why there is, is literature out there saying you just need to hire for skills. And I'll, I'll talk about that when I do the case study. And just to touch on tools. So we implemented our new data platform, our new cloud-based data platform in 2019. Our our, our data warehouse now, our cloud-based data warehouse is now our new legacy. So in the space of two years, that, that thing that we were so proud of building in 20, 2019 is now already our legacy. That's how fast the technology is changing. So every, every single tool we use now is legacy. Uh, we need to keep a flexible mindset and we, we need to have position your team to expect to learn new things all the time. Uh, and, and to just understand that we're all lifelong learners now. Now I'm going to pop into the case study. So I'm going to give a brief overview of UNSW because I'm conscious that not everybody has heard of us. Um, so University of New South Wales is a uh, large university. We're about 60,000 students and we're really nicely placed geographically. Uh, I haven't seen the campus for a year, but I look forward to going back in the not too distant future. 
So we're 15 minutes away from the centre of the city, we're 15 minutes away from the international airport, we're 10 minutes away from the beach, and we also have campuses in Canberra where we run the Australian Defence Force Academy and our art college in Paddington, which is always a fun place to visit. Um, so we're, we're very highly ranked, uh, we're a very prestigious university, we've got and a plethora of researchers. Uh, we've got some really highly ranked subjects. Um, we've been investing in our research infrastructure, which is uh, excellent. And probably the most interesting fact about UNSW is we, uh, we produce more startup founders than any other university in Australia and more millionaires than any other university in Australia. So they're, they're two enjoyable facts about us. Um, so it's a pretty big place, it's pretty complex. So we started with um, our legacy enterprise data warehouse and we, it has been around for 20 years. Well, it was around. We decommissioned it in February this year. And some of the benefits of that platform were, were that it was a very high degree of trust in it and people believed the numbers and everybody used it. So we didn't have that thing that a lot of organisations have of no enterprise data warehouse. Some of the challenges were that the business rules had never been uh, validated and had never been updated. So the highly trusted legacy data warehouse was actually incorrect. But the good thing was it was reliably and consistently incorrect, so it was reasonable to make decisions based on it. But uh, that's not really how you want to run your data and analytics operations. It was extremely slow in our legacy platform to develop new reports. Sometimes it could be up to six months to just turn out a new tabular report, so no speed to market. And uh, the tool set was, was really hard to use and had a really, really high learning curve. And with all of that, we were faced with uh, increasing demand and increased uncertainty in the world uh, externally and across the university. So that, that increasing demand where people wanted insights from us and we weren't able to deliver. So that was, the, that was how we started. And we did our, uh, a maturity assessment and we basically realised that we were at level one and we actually needed to start to be operating at level three to four. Uh, and, you know, to get real value for the organisation, we needed to be at least level three, but preferably level four. But no, we, we really don't see any, uh, we don't see any marginal benefit for trying to get to level five. We might get there, but we're not proposing it. So we, we thought about what we do and what we wanted to do, what we aspired to do. So what, are, what do we want to be? Well, we want to really be a, an innovative data science operation that can do analytics and has an information portal. So we, we were really skilled, really highly skilled at this stuff in the efficiency box, but not so much in the other two. Uh, but we needed to be able to work across all of these. So this, this led into the data strategy and it was an extremely consultative process uh, that we went through, but it, came, it boils down to two things and, and really simple things. The first thing we wanted to do was get people the information they need to do their job without them having to ask for it, which seems pretty straightforward, but he's not. And we also needed, we also wanted to stop people across the organisation having to extract CSV files from various systems and munge them together into spreadsheets to find the information that they need. So that was that was the, the nub of our data strategy. And we were working uh, across, working at say, well, what we need to do. We need to get faster from from data to insight. We needed to, we knew we needed to build a modern data platform and we wanted to remove the data silos because we were conscious that there had been data that had been locked up in various systems that nobody could get access to. So that was really an important thing. And an important thing was to, my team used to make people unhappy, not because they didn't do a good job, but because there was more demand than they could meet. 
So what we decided to do was turn my team from being the report writers to the data engineers, and they would build automated data pipelines that would enable domain specialists to build their own Power BI dashboards and visualizations. And this has worked really well for us. So uh, we had a, an HR subject matter expert who built all the HR dashboards based on the pipelines and models that we developed. So she could drag and drop uh, into the, her Power BI's and she could publish those herself. So we now scale much better than we did before. And so the team is the data platform team. We're, we're now the data engineers. We provide advice and support. We enable and empower people, but they are in charge of developing their own insights. And increasingly now we can scale because we're not the ones doing all the report development like we used to. So I'll run through how we did it. And again, this is, this is a lot of organisational change stuff. And if anybody's uh, XGE, uh, you'll see some familiar stuff in here. So we start, started out with this effective change equation where you need to have a reasonable technical solution. You need to engage with your customer base to get their acceptance to achieve overall effectiveness. Now, throughout this, I had in the back of my mind that there is this, this technology adopt and adoption curve and uh, so the thing that I did was find the early adopters in my team to help me kick off the project. Um, and then there were the laggards who were clinging to the old ways until the last possible minute. And we, we used this um, GE's Change Acceleration Program uh, because process because that's one that I've really worked with. And we actually were trying to work from creating shared need right through to instantiating the change in practice. So we, we knew that we needed to have a technical strategy that made sense. We needed to have leadership on board and all in alignment. And we knew that we needed to have cultural and organisational change strategy because Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to shift to meet customer needs. And some of the key change messages that we developed are, and we developed these as elevator pitches so that my team could use these in conversation with people or in presentations. So here's what our project is about. Here's why it's important to change. Here's what successful look like. Here's what we need from you because we needed things from other people too. So, you know, it wasn't just us doing stuff for other people. We need people to do things to help us make these changes. And the most important one is here's what you can count on from us. So pe telling people here, if you help us, we will deliver X, Y, Z to you. So this is, this is some of the important stuff uh, for, the, for any change program. So you can't do this alone. You, you need to get cross-organisational cross buy-in. Uh, you need top-down support. You need budget. You need support from your team. And you need accept, general acceptance from the business. And I'm going to go into some of the systems and structures stuff that we, we did to uh, help us to realign and help us to get the changes in both our own practice and in our business practice. So these are some of the things that, that you need to look at when you're trying to uh, change your systems and structures. So the, the first decision that we made was we were not going to hire any new people. We were going to transition our new our legacy people, our legacy platform people to our new platform. Uh, and but that meant they had to learn, they had to go from being the gurus on the old platform to being novices on the new platform. And I'm delighted to say that now, two years, three years down the track, they are gurus on the new platform too, and really pleased to see that. Um, the other thing was that we, we made time for people to undertake training and education and on the job training too 
during business hours and we built that into our sprint process. We, we measured everything. Uh, so we use Agile, we use a Scrum Agile methodology, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, we do DevOps, we have continuous integration, continuous deployment, which was all very new to my team, but I knew the value of that. And we, could, we were able to demonstrate that our productivity improved significantly over the duration of the project. And it also went up when we all went home to work from home with COVID. So that's been interesting. Um, and we also used our Agile process to drive the communications with our stakeholders because they're very much part of that Agile process. And the, um, we, we embedded our technology change into the Agile and DevOps process. So there was no way to get code from dev to test to prod without using our DevOps tools and processes. So, you know, you kind of force the change uh, but then people get used to it and then understand why it's essential. So I'm just gonna go through some of these. So the first thing is, we've, I've been using Agile since 2004, and I really think it's a, a great way to run any kind of technology uh, business. So I find it's the most efficient and effective way for us. The important thing about this is how the uh, the business uh, participants in this process. So uh, I had it summed up for me uh, by one of the marketing managers at, at Westfield when she said, I didn't get everything I wanted, but I wanted everything I got. And so that that sort of comment summed up for me why, why Scrum is a really valuable approach. There are many others, it's just one I like. And the other thing that we do is um, I've explained to the team that if they want to work on interesting things, they need to get all the routine stuff super optimised and super organised. So we've developed a series of architecture patterns so that we don't have to think about what we're doing. So um, our architecture process is really strong and really valuable and it's driven by the team. Now I don't even go to the meetings. Um, the other thing is that we wanted to start to develop design patterns too, so that again, we don't have to think about things. If we, if we optimize all the routine stuff, then we have free time so we can do cool stuff like AI and ML. So for our uh, design patterns, we um, used the uh, UK government's um, documentation method, which I'll, I've shared in the slides. Uh, that's really good. We have a process whereby the whole team reviews architecture patterns and design patterns and improves them before we approve them. And continuous improvement is essential. So uh, we, we constantly, uh, we consistently think about what we've done, we optimise what we've done and we cost optimise everything we do because we're in the cloud now and everything costs. So we really have to be very conscious of our expenditure. And the, the final thing for us is we've also built feedback into our process. Um, and so this, this, is, this is our one of, the, one of our dashboards. And you can see in the, the top right hand corner, corner there's a feedback form. We take every single piece of customer feedback and we review it and on a monthly basis we put that into our backlog and then we prioritize it with our business colleagues for action. So what we're doing is starting to have that really profitable feedback loop so that we're improving things in ways that the community value. And so we get feedback like this quite often, you know, this is one that came in the other day so I decided to drop it into these slides. Um, and, you know, that people really love that we, we listen to them and they're absolutely delighted when I ping them and go, oh, that thing you asked for, that's going live next week. So, you know, that and the team like getting feedback like that. So this is all of the things is, is the, the practices that we've developed, the team bonds that we've developed are all being reinforced by happy customers. So everybody is now part of a virtuous cycle and it's kind of self-perpetuating, I hope. 
So what are our results? Our customers are happy. Not all of them, some of them are quite grumpy people, but you know, you, everyone's got those kind of people. Uh, the team are now globally recognized leaders uh, they, and, and we've won numerous awards for, for data analytics leadership. And it's become quite hilarious now because I come in and go, oh, we've won another one. We've been nominated for another thing. Um, but it's down to them and the work that they've done that we've had that recognition. And the nice thing is we enjoy coming to work. And the other important thing is the team are the ones that are coming up with the new ideas. At the start of this process, I was the one that came up with all the new ideas. Now the team come up with the majority of new ideas and we work out how to incorporate them. The other thing is we're getting better at being able to onboard new people into our team. So we've got um, onboarding videos, we've got an onboarding um, process now that, that we've developed. Um, and pretty much all of us are open to learning new things. So as I said, you know, our data warehouse now is our legacy. So we're learning uh, new, new platform stuff so that we can move on to the next thing beyond, beyond the enterprise data warehouse. So these are some things that I've learned on the way and some things that I think are pot potentially valuable. So I really think that these are the takeaways though, if you can explain what your project is about, why it's important to change, what success will look like, what, what you need from people, what they can expect from you. Pretty much everybody will be able to get on board with your change program. So thank you. Hi, Kate. Thanks uh, so much. I think very, very informative. Um, and there's been quite a number of questions that have come up. Um, so I'm going to just run through some of those questions in the in the order that they, they came up, starting with uh, a question from Maritza. Um, she says, uh, it's becoming harder to attract and retain, and retain sorry, data and anal analytics talent. Um, any tips on how an organization can create visibility as a preferred place to work? for data and analytics talent in a very competitive recruitment environment. Yeah, I hear you. Um, you know, like we, we, we teach data and analytics people and we're trying to work out how we can get them before they go off to other places. Um, I, think, I think, you know, though, the word of mouth is really important uh, for, for this and um, try and tap into your network of people who've left on good terms because They've left, but they've possibly got fond memories of the place and can send you people. Um, so that's something, I just noticed my dog rambling in the middle, rumbling in the background, sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, so so try, try, try to tap into your networks of alumni that have worked with you. Fair advice, good advice. Uh, next up is a question from Ian. Thanks, Ian. Um, besides dashboards, does a uh, business develop their own tabular uh, or analytical reporting as well? I assume enterprise-wide standard reports were still managed centrally. They are, um, and we, we still develop those things. Uh, but increasingly now, we've, we've um, empowered domain specialists in particular business units. So we have a research division, we have HR, um, we have um, learning and teaching. So we're empowering business uh, people to, to develop their own. And what we this is why we've kind of gone beyond the data warehouse because the data warehouse, while it was really great, was limiting us. So now we've gone to something where, where we can present the data in a drag and drop form so they can construct their own models to drive their own visualizations. Okay, fantastic. The next one from Hanley's, which is kind of a follow on to that question, says we have the same in, uh, sentiment as Ian. Just to add to his question, how did you go about getting business users to build their own reports uh, from upskilling and change management perspective? So we have um, a, a practice that we developed through this process. Um, so we started out on this journey in late 2018. And um, we started out with this, we went to the business and said, it would be really, would would you like to develop some dashboards and would you like to, to come and embed with us? So we got them pre-COVID, so in the olden days, 
the before times as they call them, um, people came and sat with us for like three to six months and worked with us to develop, to document the business rules that we needed to apply and stuff. And then it was pretty easy and and we um, we didn't pay for any training. We just used online free training. Uh, we're, we're a Microsoft shop, so uh, there, there is a plethora of free online training that people can work their way through. And our example of the HR business subject matter expert, she just sat down and did the online training and stepped through it and then just built her first dashboard and with, with us sitting right next to her. And that was really important, having them sitting embedded with us so they could pop their head up and go, oh, how do I do this? Um, so that was really yeah. a good process. And we've replicated it now with three other business units. So, Okay, fantastic. Uh, next question is from Faiz. Um, what is your opinion on allowing business users to develop their own data pipelines into the EDW, looking at it from a self-service capability? Um, so... So we, we are just uh, now working with our first business unit who are going to develop their own pipelines. Um, but it's, it's a matter of them having the skills. Uh, so we, we tried it with the library, but their technical skills just weren't where we needed them to be able to automate pipelines. And we automate our pipelines as code, so it's pretty technical. Um, but the the people in the learning and teaching uh, business unit have have pretty good technical skills, so we're quite optimistic. And and part of my value prop sorry sorry to interrupt Greg no part of my value proposition is we create the secure bubble in which all of this happens, so nobody else has to worry about security. Okay, okay. Um, next uh, question is from Thomas. Um, what is your experience in the difference in costing of on-prem versus cloud solutions? Um, well, the, the, the thing with, with on-prem is, is you have a fixed server size for your cost and, and it's typically CapEx. So it tends to be, I don't know what your organisation's like. I came from banking and finance before I came into higher education and it was always easier to get CapEx and OpEx and it seems to be the same in higher ed and it was the same in banks. It was much more simple to get to get OPEX, to get get CapEx. Um, so you can buy a big server. But one of the benefits um, for us is we, can, we automatically upsize stuff. So when we load our data overnight, we, we automatically scale up and out our, our servers and load it up really fast and then sh then put close them down again. So, uh, but the one comment I will make is um, if you're if you're moving to cloud as infrastructure as a service, expect your costs to go up really fast because infrastructure as a service is a very expensive form of cloud. So uh, I made the decision to go with a platform as a service. Um, solution for our our data platform because then we don't have any of the the overheads and it's much cheaper um and but we cost optimize every month we sit down and review what we've done and look at what's costing us more and see if there are cheaper ways to do it and stuff so you've got to have some discipline because everything costs in the cloud yeah uh, next question is from leon um he asks, how much learning was needed to get the end users to create their own reports? You may have alluded to that in the previous question, um, but I don't know if there's anything else you may want to add to that. Um, I think it was really important to have, have the people embedded with us so that they could pop their heads up and ask questions as they were going. So they were doing the, doing the learning and then trying it themselves. Um, so I think that interaction was really valuable. Okay, fantastic. Uh, next one is from Sean. Uh, how big is your team? Um, my team is about 10, 10 or 11. Okay. Uh, next one's from Lizette. Uh, what mistakes did you make on your journey and what would you do different with hindsight? Uh, yeah, no, it's always, a valid, always a valuable <laughs> question. Um, um, so I, I think I think I overestimated people's ability to understand the why of the cloud, the why why we needed to go to cloud and why we needed to go to platform as a service and the cost implications of that. 
Uh, so, so I, I think that was that was something that I wish I'd done differently. Um, and uh, I think finding the right partners. We had we got we had some partners in early on who were just dreadful, and I should have cut them loose much faster than I did. And then I found a really good partner that really understood the vision and what we were trying to achieve and really partnered with us and they were really great so you know if you if you get it wrong with your partners just cut them loose really fast that's my lesson there okay uh next question is from leanne um this uh how did you get the message of change across in other words the separation of roles operational data and data scientists to ensure focus um, so, so this was actually part, this was all proposed as part of our data strategy, and our data strategy we did consultation on throughout 2018. So there were a num so a huge number of meetings and things and consultations across the entire business uh, before we embarked on this project, and and then um, we got business people involved as part of our agile process so they were part of they helped us to co-design everything uh, so uh, that that's why I really value the agile process because it brings business into the process and there it's not just us and them it's us okay last one I've got uh, Kate is from Natasha uh, she says, once business are technically trained for their own report development, many have challenges in understanding the volumes of data that they are requesting, uh, which may not actually be useful. We've seen this in a self-service environment. Any thoughts on managing the business people education in that context? Oh, yeah. It's, it's a good question. Uh, it, it's um, it's an ongoing problem. And uh, in, in our context, what we found, because with our legacy data warehouse, it was developed 20 years ago. So there was no concept of data governance and it was just a free for all. People had access to data that you looked at and like, oh, my God, they've got that. <laughs> and we took, it, we took it off them. So we gave them two years notice and did an, an enormous amount of consultation to say, you're not going to have access to this data anymore. And uh, they and we finally turned it off at the end of February this year. Um, so people want want to they want large amounts of data to prospectively trawl through it and see things and we're still doing that education process where we say we're not going to give it to you and the other thing is as part of our data governance process we've instituted a policy for, for data governance that's called data sharing agreements so anybody who wants to access data needs to get the data controller's permission and so they have to con they have to convince very hard nosed people in the business that they really need that data before they're allowed to have it. So there's a process that happens before they come before the request comes to us for the data sharing agreement, and it, and it drives out a lot of those conversations before the request comes to us. So that that was a good thing that I did. I didn't know it was a good thing at the time, but the data sharing agreements as part of data governance was really useful. I discovered. Okay, we just had another question pop up from Tabiso. Thanks, Tabiso. What is the quali uh, the data quality management strategy you have adopted for your organisation? Uh, well, we kind of left um, data quality for uh, we didn't we didn't prioritise data quality. We've got data quality problems. Don't get me wrong. Um, so I started in this role in late twenty fourteen. And I prioritised data governance first because we had three consultants' reports that all said do data governance first, so I did. Um, and then uh, in late 2018, I started to look at the data strategy and what we should do. And, and only now, um, in late 2021, are we actually looking at data quality. So I think we weren't we weren't ready before that, um, but we have now got a burning platform reason. So it's always good when you've got a burning platform. Um, so the government has decided it wants to hook directly into our student system to hoover data out. Um, so our data needs to be correct. So now everybody cares about data quality. So now's the right time. Absolutely. Um, there's an interesting one from uh, from Vuyo. Uh, thanks for you. Why do you not believe in trade skill, but people who want to learn new things? Um, what is your thought process behind that? Elon Musk, 
um, <laughs> says he must must have come out saying he does not care about people's degrees. Uh, are you taking uh, the same approach? Well, I, I can't care about people's degrees because I, I've got no qualifications in technology whatsoever. So my undergraduate was an arts degree with okay. majors in history, philosophy and anthropology. Uh, and my other degrees are management and um, and cybersecurity and terrorism. So, you know, I, I have this policy um, because I've, I've realised over the years from watching that smart people can learn things. So if you find somebody who's who already knows one programming language, they can they prove they can learn a language. They can learn a new one. And yeah. and my team, they were experts on our legacy platform three years ago, and now they're experts on our new platform, and they are world leaders. So you know. Yeah. There is that saying, uh, higher for attitude, you can always train skills, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole lot of people that argue the opposite on the, on the internet, but, you know, that's the internet. Yeah. Um, that's just how I roll. So, you know, you don't have to do it that way, but I just, I like to hire smart people who are capable of learning new things and who want to learn new things because, like I said, our, our, our new data warehouse is legacy now. We're, we're migrating away from it. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Kate, thank you so much. Uh, we, we're kind of running out of time. So, um, oh, sorry, one more question's come in. We've still got a minute or two uh, from Mark. Um, you mentioned that you recently decommissioned uh, your warehouse. Did you approach the technical debt com component? So we, we actually spent the last two years um, analyzing all of the legacy data warehouse reports and not recreating them, but reimagining them. So we we reimagined them in the new platform. So we didn't just do a lift and shift, and there wasn't. Um, so when it came time to turn it off, uh, there we had met most of the information needs that the previous data warehouse did. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Kate. Thank you for so your insight. Sorry, 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 one more yes. one more thing. Sorry, um, yes. but the technical debt. Thing. So we have um, a practice in our team that when we incur technical debt, we note it. So we note it when in our user stories when it is technical debt. And then what we do is we have periodic sprints where we just address technical debt. So we prioritise our technical debt and then and address it. So we don't like leave technical debt to hang around our necks like a smelly fish or something. <laughs> okay, great. Kate, thanks very much. We, we appreciate uh, your time this evening in Australia. For us, it's uh, it's 11.30 in the morning, so we really thank you for your time spent and the, and the insights that you've shared with us. Uh, thanks, guys, for all the questions. I think great questions and, and, and well responded to in terms of your experience um, in Australia. So, Kate, thanks again. We appreciate it. Uh, thanks guys, for Yeah, thank you.